Welcome to People Love Process. Every summer, I teach in Hartford Art School's MFA illustration program. As one of their staff, I'm invited to lecture every few years, and my last lecture was titled Illustrative Design, and I'd like to share my talk with you. So that's what we're going to go through in this movie. I think you're going to find it fun because there's a lot of information, a few funny stories, and some insights that can apply to you. Now, this talk was for uh, distinctly illustrators, but it applies to anybody creative. So whether or not you ever want to become an illustrator really doesn't matter because the principles I'm going to share can apply to what you love to do. So let's jump into it. Now, growing up, I had a lot of influences. One of the big ones for me was Richard Scarry's best storybook ever. His rainy day book was also awesome. But this specific book I'm showing you here is the one that really drew me into understanding color because they get into color. So it's really important to kind of take those things that kind of anchored you to pursue creativity and uh, fully understand it in its proper context. Now, at the time, you know, when I was a little kid, I wasn't thinking anything about that, but it intrigued me and drew me in. And it's fun to go back and realize what influences uh, kind of shaped who you are and what you love to do. So Richard Scarry was a big one for me. And another one, my uh parents, both my mom and my dad, mainly my dad, though, uh, he really liked big band music. And so he had a big LP cabinet kind of record player with speakers built in and all of his LPs were in there. And I like looking at the cover art on these LPs, specifically the one shown here. This artwork drew me to him. And I just love how it was done. Now, at the time, I had no idea that an art director by the name of Jim Flora, who worked for RCA uh, Records back in the 50s, had illustrated these. It's only later in life that I would uh, realize how much this really influenced me. I love this style, so that's why I'm showing it, because right outside my office door uh, that comes into my studio, I have all of these albums and the original albums. This is a miniature one. It's not a full-size uh, LP, but I always buy the smaller ones because the form factor is really cool. Uh, but this one's one of the classics, the Mambo for Cats. And I have all the other ones framed on my studio wall outside uh, the entrance to my studio. So love this artwork. It was a huge influence into uh, me pursuing my uh, segmented style. So uh, just understand where why you love what you love now, and you're going to discover some things that you probably haven't thought about since childhood, which is always fun. Uh, growing up, I also love collecting not only baseball cards, which is uh, something that I ended up doing. I worked at Upper Deck for a while, uh, but I collected what were called wacky packs, and these were parody illustrations that, uh, frankly, in today's environment, they would never do these because, one, these brands would probably sue them because they would get all disgruntled that it's making fun of their brand, which they spend millions on. Uh, but it's part of the copyright process, meaning copyright protects parody. Um, I have some artwork of mine that I made fun of Mickey Mouse, but it's copyrighted uh, under the category of parody. So yes, you can do that. Does that mean a company won't still try to get somebody sued or get disgruntled because they're making fun? No, they, they can still choose to sue if they want to. But I love these growing up because the brands, especially this one, the the Peanuts, uh, the, the, the Planners Peanuts, there's no way they'd let this go through plastered, you know, whiskey flavored peanuts. So it was just, it, these are awesome. Uh, when I first started my own business, well, actually, it's a couple of years after I started my own business, uh, my own studio, um, eBay hadn't been around a whole long time. And just I just was thinking of wacky packs. And I went on eBay and I found a printer who used to work for Tops back in the day. That's who uh, printed all of these uh, stickers back then. And they were selling uncut sheets. So I have an uncut sheet of uh, wacky packs in my studio hanging on the wall. 
And that was a lot of fun. But eventually the artist who created a lot of these paintings, these were painted full size on a hot illustration board. They started selling the original art for all these on uh, eBay and it took off. And you, you can go there now and I don't even know if they're available anymore, but he was making like five, $6,000 off of the illustrations for these. So uh, kind of interesting how after time goes, even this type of art can uh, gain value. Uh, so that was a big inspiration. Just the humor factor of them is what I really liked. And um, I remember the day where a neighborhood kid, my neighborhood, uh, his father uh, would buy these uh, volumes of books, which were just all the different issues of Mad Magazine published in one volume. And he gave me a copy of Mad Magazine that he had. And I had never heard of Mad Magazine. I took it home, read it, read through it, and I just loved it. I loved the humor. I loved all the artwork. I loved the little margin doodles that uh, Sergio Aragonis did, Spy versus Spy, you name it. This was awesome. Now, my problem was... I didn't tell my parents, my mom or my dad, because I knew my mom specifically would not approve of Mad Magazine. And sure enough, I didn't hide my Mad Magazine well enough. My mom found it and she she comes to me, what is this trash? You know, and she threw it away. Well, the very next day, I ride my bike down to the drugstore, bought another one, and just made sure to hide it better. Now, I told her that story after the fact uh, several years back, and she just started laughing now. Uh, but Mad Magazine was a huge influence on me in terms of using artwork to communicate. In this case, they made fun of all kinds of pop culture references and uh, news stories. So, uh still was just such a huge fun time growing up uh, getting the new issue a mad magazine now when i heard they're bringing it to the ipad years ago um i decided to get a subscription to see how it was and you know what they've tamed it down so much it used to be counterculture it used to be subversive meaning it made fun of anything and everything and they kind of backed away from that and it lost all of its appeal to me. So I kind of like the underground comic aspects of where Mad started, not so much the corporate aspects of uh, who bought it and what they're trying to do with it now, but still a huge influence in me. So what is illustrative design? Well, this is the easiest way I can explain it. If you think of the target brand mark shown on the left here, these are just elliptical shapes. You could probably build this in Adobe Illustrator in 25 seconds or so, not too hard at all. That is quintessential graphic design. If you look at a mark like the Starbucks brand mark uh, with the illustrative mermaid in it, well, that's some point in the creative process in creating that they had to draw it out and they had to work this design out in a drawn format in order to know what to build in terms of vector shapes and objects inside of Illustrator. So that would be the difference between graphic design and what I categorize as illustrative design. Now, I didn't coin that phrase. I'm not, I've been using it for years, um, but I'm pretty sure Saul Bass, uh, one of the best designers in our industry, was an illustrative designer, and he definitely believed in every creative person drawing. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. So uh, commercial art. Uh, I, it was a very young age for me when I kind of put two and two together. Now, I love Mad Magazine and collecting baseball cards and wacky packs and everything like that. But one thing now, in hindsight, uh, we go over to a, a friend's of ours house and she has an old, uh, my friend's wife has an old uh, Betty Crocker cookbook and there's all this awesome retro illustration in it. Now it's limited because of the print technology at the time. This is back in the 50s again and they didn't want to print full color. So they would print in two color, black and these spot colors and this just shows every time I go over there, I go through her cookbook and take photos with my iPhone. That's where all these came from. Uh, but I love this style. I love the simplicity of this style. 
And the thing is, is even with digital methods today, this is still a valid style. Uh, one might call it mid-century art. Uh, that's fine. It definitely, that's where it's derived from. Um, but this just shows you how you don't have to over, I don't know, over colorize and detail illustration. It could be as simple as this, and it looks elegant and sophisticated and definitely a lot of fun and communicates well. Now, they use that technology because, as you can see, back in this the same time period, a full page ad that uh, Hormel Foods Spam specifically did a recipe they wanted to share with everybody. Spam and limas. Not only does that sound disgusting, the photographic quality and the reproduction of that photograph, in this case, a periodical, a magazine that I found, uh, just doesn't look very appetizing. And that's where illustrate why illustration was used so much back in the early days is because it was easier to get a concept across and not worry about trying, in this case, to look appetizing. I, I don't see how spam and limas could ever look appetizing. It's kind of disgusting. But here's another ad, a, a little younger, about five years prior to this. And it's just, once again, two colors, black, uh, just in grayscale with a second color hit of blue worked into it with various tints and stuff. But this one's just hilarious because just the copywriting. Warm air that's right for growing children. Like, you don't want to use the wrong air. You know, your children might morph into weird, uh, weird DNA. I don't know, like, whatever. I, I'm trying to be funny and I should just keep moving on. But it's these ads. This is why I like retro ads. Uh, me and my friend John used to drive up to Portland, Oregon, which is just about 40 minutes north of us. And there used to be a store called Periodical Paradise in Portland, and they had old publications. And so I'd always go there and buy old popular mechanics and Life magazine uh, publications because they had ads like these in them, which are just gold to use in a design context at times. So uh, uh, for whatever reason, there is a lot of like cut out head smoking pipes in these publications as well. But again, these just make for really great uh, kind of kitschy uh, design devices if you're putting together something that you could benefit by using a retro flair. So I just wanted to throw these heads in because they're just cool looking. Now, illustration's been around a long time uh, commercially. So this goes back to the 60s. And Jolly Green Giant was in existence, but as the late 60s is rolling into the 70s, and they decided to introduce a new secondary brand character. And I remember him in all the commercials growing up called Sprout. And this is Sprout that uh, the Jolly Green Giant is holding out in his hand. But just look at the style that the Jolly Green Giant was in. It's just a black ink line with a wash of watercolor. Uh, thrown into it. And it's very apropos for the 1960s in terms of illustration style and the vibe. But as it's going into the 70s, the way uh, Sprout looks like is the animated style they use for all those commercials. And this was actually a, a PR release by the ad agency who was doing this on behalf of Green Giant. Uh, nowadays, if you look at their packaging, this shows a Green Giant uh, can of corn, for example, and you can see they're still using illustration in the background for the Green Giant. Now, Sprout, kind of as a brand asset, kind of died off years ago. I haven't seen him since I was growing up. Uh, but the Green Giant is still being leveraged in an illustrative sense. You can see the style is more... Uh, traditionally realistic of sorts. Not that a green giant's real, but uh, just the styling isn't as loose as what you saw in the 60s. So a lot of different ways uh, you can style, in this case, for commercial purposes, illustration. Now, one of my best friends, uh, Michael Bass, is an illustrator based out of the Chicago area. And years ago, this goes back quite a few years. I was at the How Design Conference, and he decided to fly in a little late, and uh, he didn't realize he wasn't going to be able to get a room. Well, I had a room with with two um, uh, two beds in it, so I said, why don't you just stay in my room? And he goes, well, 
okay, but just to let you know, I have a deadline due Monday and I have to work on this packaging tonight. Well, the packaging illustration he is working on was for Celestial Seasoning Zinger Teas. You can see the painted uh, illustration below that, which shows the sunrise and the fruit zooming out, kind of coming out from that uh, sunrise and coming towards the viewer. And that's what he was painting on his uh, MacBook with a little uh, uh, Wacom a tablet and he's painting in a Corel draw or Corel painter program. Now, Michael never went to art school. His, um, his aunt bought him uh, lessons at Chicago art Institute. So that's where he learned how to draw and paint growing up. But once again, he never formally went to art school. He just started painting on his own, got really proficient with it, walked into an ad agency way back when, he's a little older than me, and they hired him on the spot. And that's where he learned how to uh, kind of take his talent and illustration and apply it in a commercial sense. Now, I was sitting, you could tell there's two geeky uh, kind of design art related people uh, on a Friday night are, are we out hanging out with other creatives, talking shop or whatever down in the hotel bar or wherever? No, we're <laughs> we're both sitting in our hotel room. Mike's working on this and he was painting the strawberry and I'm just watching him and he's not looking at reference. He's just painting and I'm going, How, what? I go, you're not even looking at reference. And he goes, and he just stops and he goes, Vaughn, once you paint 400 strawberries, you just know what a strawberry looks like. And then I kind of felt stupid. And then he keeps painting. And then a few, uh, about 30 seconds later, he stops and he, well, he says under his breath, and this one I just took from an old Smucker's label I did and brought it into this. I go, oh, you suck. You know, so uh, he's, he's a very talented illustrator. This is one he did. Here's another one. You've probably seen his work before. Actually, if you go into the grocery store, that's like his portfolio. Uh, but he did the Hidden Valley Ranch uh, valley scene here in the pitcher and the vegetables and cream. Uh, that is also used on uh, some of their packaging as well. So uh, he's been doing this a long time, and he's, you once again, he's on Pringles. Every time I go into the grocery store, I see his work on something. So now growing up, I was pretty young. I was about 10 years old, and my dad was just raving at breakfast one day about this new product that came out called Armor All. And he's and my dad had a Chevy Impala. This wasn't his car, but this is the type of model he had at the time. And he was just raving about how good this product worked. And I didn't really care too much about that kind of stuff, but I got curious. So I went out after uh, breakfast and he was still working on his car using Armor All. And I picked up the bottle and I looked at it and I'm going, wow. That's kind of cool artwork they have on that bottle, this little Viking. And that was the first time I kind of go, wait a minute, somebody drew that. And this company is using it to like sell their product. And I get the metaphor going on, you know, it's armor all. It's going to protect your car from, well, not exactly thunder, but, you know, it's a protectant. And that's when it first clicked for me what commercial art was all about. And I go, well, that's kind of cool. You know, Armor All has progressed on. This is what they're currently using, which I really do not like at all. Uh, the face looks wonky. The helmet looks like somebody knocked them in the side of the head and it kind of twisted. So it's in the wrong perspective. And it just looks like this character is wearing a costume. It doesn't make him look like a Viking. And his shield doesn't really look appropriate either it's almost like they're trying to make it a superhero which in my opinion is just wrong-headed and the hand looks so kind of geometric i i just don't like what they're currently using now um, i'd love to read the, actually maybe i'll do that for a future uh, people of movie is i'll just redo armor all the way i think it should be done actually that'd make a fun topic now my dad was going to give me this car when I got into high school so I could drive it. And I was thrilled about that and until my 
brother totaled it one one night and rolled it down the side of a, a hill. So that never happened. But growing up, when I was, I'd say I was about 10 years old, um, you know, I, I went and asked my dad, I go, hey, dad, can, can I drive your Impala? And my dad didn't say, no, you're not old enough to drive yet. He just said, well, you need a driver's license to drive. And so I just went and went to where he keeps his wallet on this little caddy and I pulled his license out and I go, okay, I can make my own license. So bless my mom. She saved everything growing up. So I made a counterfeit driver's license uh, showing myself. And then I took it to my dad and said, okay, I have a driver's license now. And instead of my, my dad just laughing over it, eventually he did. Uh, he looks at it and he goes, well, you're, this is counterfeiting. And he explains what he's trying to explain to a 10 year old, what counterfeiting is all about. And I think about that and it just makes me laugh uh, even more. So, uh, trying to solve my problems at a very young age with creativity, I guess would be the ultimate uh, moral of that story. So illustrative design influence. Now I've talked about some of those growing up, but we all have them. And in this industry, my biggest influence in terms of illustrative design is definitely Saul Bass. And once again, I just want to remind you, go to YouTube and just type in Saul Bass talks about drawing and you're going to find a video of an interview somebody did with him back in the late 1990s. I believe is around 1997 and it is absolute gold uh, for understanding why a designer should draw. So make sure to watch that. You'll be glad you did. Um, but Saul Bass has one of the best design quotes in our industry, and that is design is thinking made visual. That's all illustrative design is all about, is taking that idea and thinking about it in a visual way so you can uh, explore a full range of design possibilities. Now, Saul Bass is probably best known for his illustrative design posters. So the one shown on the left is um, a, a movie poster. Uh, for um, anatomy of a murder. It's really cool. It's kind of cut paper looking. You can see another one, same type of aesthetic showing on the right, uh, the man with the golden arm. So a lot of really cool stuff. Now he was a big brand designer as well. And here's the original Quaker Oats brand. You can definitely tell this was an illustrative design. And this is kind of a reproduction because the face looked a little better. I just couldn't find a good quality uh, vector image. that uh, So this one would have to do. But he did the original UPS logo. He did a lot of these airlines from back in the day, uh, the original AT&T logo, so on and so forth. So a big name brand designer at the time. Now, the Master of Fine Arts program I teach in, Nancy Stahl is one of my creative, illustrative uh, heroes. Um, I've always loved her work, she, and mainly because she worked in Vector. So you can see a U.S. Um, Postal Service stamp she designed with this uh, dolphin on it. Absolutely beautiful. And the coolest part is whenever you get to meet your creative heroes, it's always kind of cool. So one of the first years I taught, I was able to meet Nancy Stahl. Sorry for this hostage quality photo, because I'm not proficient in doing selfies, but I was able to meet and teach in the same program she did. Uh, so that was really cool, uh, being able to, to meet her in person finally after all these years of being inspired by her work. You can just see the beautiful work she does. A lot of stamps. You've probably used some of these stamps. Here's even more. She works in a variety of styles. So you can see she made it look like a sweater with the reindeer in the top right. And just, just a lot of really cool work. All of it is vector. She's just an incredibly gifted illustrator and a really nice person as well. So here's another influence on me. This is Tracy Sabin. He's who I would call an illustrative designer. Now for years, sorry to admit this, but I thought Tracy was a female uh, because of Tracy being the name, only to find out later, what, it's a dude? I didn't know that. And it's like, uh, but he does these really great uh, illustrative designs. Here's a college uh, mascot he did, which is really cool, but he does all kinds of really 
really cool work. And he took the time to share his, uh, some images about his process. So he's working on a real estate kind of venture and it's in an area he decides uh, that area is uh, synonymous with a certain species of bird. So he's looking at photos, just doing his own research and to understand what type of birds they are, what their nests look like. And you can see some of his initial sketches on the right here. And he starts drawing those out, working out his concepts, working out his ideas. Here's a bunch of different design directions he pitches to his client. And then he art directs himself. And I think this is the most important part of being a designer, whether you're distinctly a graphic designer or you're a designer who wants to do some illustrative design, you have to art direct yourself. You can't expect other people uh, to do it for you. So here he's made notes, simplify the nest, add a branch and make this only two distinct colors. And once he did that, he gets a beautiful brand mark like this. It's very artistic, but it works well for this real estate um, identity. So I just love his work. He's uh, been a huge influence on me over the years. And you can see he works in a variety of styles as well. And that also encouraged me to explore that same type of principle whenever I'm approaching a project to just use the right style that works best for the genre or target audience you're working at. So uh, Tracy Saban, one of the best in our industry, and he's still going strong. Um, now, when I went to art school, when I first started going there, they had for years been known as the Burnley School of Art and Design. This is based out of Seattle. Uh, they were eventually bought out by the art institutes and became Seattle Art Institute. So by the time I graduated, uh, that's what they had shifted over to. But I still learned everything traditionally. So here's some traditional colored pencil illustration that I created. The one on the left was for an illustration class, and we had to kind of focus on perspective. So I did this illustration of a guy sitting in a rocking chair, and then we could pick whatever subject we wanted for another project. So I picked Wayne Gretzky, and this was my uh, colored pencil illustration. Both of these were done on the hot press illustration board using Prismacolor uh, colored pencils because they were kind of waxy so you could kind of mix them uh, together so these were two illustrations uh, back in the day whenever we had to comp something up we didn't have photoshop once again i learned everything traditionally so we use pantone prismacolor markers and you can see what those are here uh, and these were one they were super expensive even back then and they didn't work that great. So you didn't want to do it on regular stock or it just suck up all the ink. And so you do it on almost like a vellum type, not tracing paper, but it's kind of like that surface of tracing paper, but a little thicker. And you could kind of paint with these. And so uh, here's some comps I did. The one on the left shows the full composition of the artwork I created with markers. And then the one on the right just shows a close-up. I go in with colored pencil and touch up areas and stuff. Uh, but this was used on a two-page ad layout for one of my classes. You can see I put a halo around them with a colored pencil. Uh, so I would use both markers and colored pencil to mock up my color comps uh, back in the day. This is uh, circa 1985 or so, something like that. If we take a look at another one, here's an advertising class. We had to do one color, grayscale only, uh, kind of one page ad. So I picked uh, the client as if it was Bausch and Lam, and they made the goggles for Kareem Abdul Jabbar. So we'd have to come up with the copywriting and everything in between. So this is another one where I did with marker comps uh, to create this composition. So um, it was kind of fun. I enjoyed, I actually, when I graduated from art school, I thought initially I wanted to get into advertising because I love the campaign uh, nature of it. So vector illustration. Um, I've been doing vector illustration now. I used freehand for 15 years. I've now used Illustrator for 
22 years. So what is that? That's uh, 37 years I've been creating vector illustration in one form or another. Now, it didn't always start that way. And one thing you might not have realized as you're watching this is the background illustration you see. I actually created this in vector format. There's a really cool app on the iPad. I haven't used it in a couple of years now because they went to subscription and I didn't use it all the time, but it's still a fabulous program because you can draw in vector format. All of this is vector. You can create texture brushes and the splattering effects and these glows are all part of it. And if you want to check out that that app just look for an iPad app called concepts and you'll be able to do this and uh, these are just are a lot of fun and maybe I'll share a time lapse I did on one of my illustrations I did in that program at some point uh, but this was a lot of fun so this is vector based now I had always take the final art I created in there and bring into Photoshop to do even more texturing uh, but just experiment with the app. I think you're going to enjoy it. I think they have a free trial period, so you don't have to subscribe uh, to see if it's something you like. So back in the day, uh, when I first interacted or figured out about vectors, it was right after the Macintosh came out. And that you can see the program on the left, obviously not a colored screen. But this little short video clip shows you what it could do. You know, you could go, you could go to whatever the setting is, but you couldn't build in preview mode. You'd had to go to, um, you had to go to uh, like the, the key line mode here. So he's going to delete this and build it. And I, I would say this is, this is one of the founders of Adobe uh, as a company creating this, John Armack. I might have gotten that name wrong, but. I didn't really like how he built that shape, to be honest with you, but you'd have to go to preview mode to see what it turned out like. So it was really kind of a wonky process. Well, it was around this time. Um, I believe this is 1987 when this uh, video was done. Um, it was in 1987 that a friend, uh, me and my friend John, who also went to the same art school as me, uh, we got contacted by a mutual friend and he invited us to come to his studio in downtown Seattle in the Smith Tower. And we did. We show up, we walk into his studio and he walks over to his desk and I see a Macintosh on his on his desk over there. And I'm like, ooh, he has a Macintosh. And he brings over a color printout. Color printouts were like next to no one had them at that point because they were so expensive and rare. And he hands me a color printout and he goes, check this out. And it was a jukebox illustration he had done, but I didn't know it at the time. I'm looking at it and I go, what is this? It's a jukebox. No, 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 no. I know what that is, but how, how'd you do it? Well, it's vector art. And I go, what's that? And he brings us over to the computer and he shows us how you create vector art. And that was the very first time I ever interacted with vector art. Now, it wouldn't be for a couple more years that I actually tried it for myself, but it wasn't even on a Mac. It was Corel Draw on a PC. And it wasn't until about a year or two after that that I first tried it on a Macintosh. And that would have been around 1991 that I tried that. So I just wanted to give you that little bit of history because I've ran into Adobe over the years. And when I started using it in 1991, at the time, Aldis owned Freehand, which was founded in Seattle. And that's what I used for 15 years from that time point moving forward until eventually Aldis got sold to Macromedia and then Adobe ended up buying uh, Mac. Well, they tried to buy it all this back in the day and the Federal Trade Commission put a kibosh on it saying, no, you can't own the number one and two software in the industry. But then they let them do it how many years later to buy out uh, Macromedia and the rest is history. So 
A uh, lot of different ways you can draw. I prefer analog, of course, because that's how I learn. Um, so I use a regular pencil or a mechanical pencil. Um, at times, I've used a Wacom to do certain styles where I want to digitally draw the line work. And of course, an Apple Pencil with whatever app you want to use on the iPad. My daughter uses Clip Studio Pro. I'm going to show you that. Uh, Clip Studio Paint, I'm sorry. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. She loves it, and she draws everything, sketches everything on her iPad. Uh, so this shows you how I use my Wacom Cintiq, and I literally ink and draw inside of Illustrator. Here I'm working on this uh, the Viking, uh, I think I called it Viking Soul, and I did this entire illustration uh, within Illustrator. Now the textures are just place bitmap uh, textures I colored, but all the artwork, all the line work, all the shading and the highlights were all done with the Wacom Cintiq inside of Illustrator uh, using a blob brush actually to ink out all of that. And I've covered that in the movie on People Love, so make sure to check that out. Uh, here's a couple other styles I like working in. The segmented style that was inspired by Jim Flora, who I showed you his artwork earlier. Uh, and you just know that if he was in today's context, he'd be rocking the vector world with his artwork in the same way. Uh, here's a nerd design I did on the right. And there's a People of Process movie that deconstructs um, how I went about that one as well. That was just a personal project for no other reason than having fun. Uh, I love doing illustrated patterns, so I create those, and there's plenty of movies on my People Love channel where you can uh, see how to create and uh, uh, work out and design your own repeat patterns, so make sure to check that out. The best way to grow your illustrative skills, once again, whether or not you want to become a full-time illustrator or not, um, experimentation is key. And you can't wait for somebody to hire you to do something. If you want to do it or you want to experiment with the style, just move out into that area on your own and do it on your own and see what you can pull off. Um, I saw years ago, and this goes back to 2003, I noticed a style trend and it was linear line illustrations or continuous line illustrations. And I just thought it was cool. A friend of mine, Felix Sockwell, he is still rocking that style. And I decided for a whole year, every time I just doodled randomly, I forced myself to do linear illustration until I got the hang of it. And then I did a whole series one year of portraits of my favorite musicians, favorite characters from shows. So here's B.B. King, great photograph I work from where he's kind of laughing and I pull that off. It, that would be so cool to see this in like a neon form on a big brick wall. And then uh, Worf from Star Trek uh, is pulled off there on the right. So distinctly different genres. Uh, but a lot of fun to experiment and try new things. Don't just um, stick with one thing and wonder why you're not getting work. Experiment. Try new things. It will open up more possibilities to land work. Here's another illustration. And it just shows I love working in vector, but I love working in textures. All of these textures in this illustration uh, were derived from a rat rod show that me and my friend John went to. And I just took photographs of just really kind of pitted out surfaces and painted surfaces on old uh, cars that were imperfect and had scrapes and scratches in it. And then I took that and applied it to this, and it just turns it into a beautiful piece of art. So uh, you can use a lot of different things to experiment and grow your abilities as a creative person and start building that skill set of an illustrator. Once again, whether or not you want to become a full-blown illustrator or not, it's just good to have that skill set so you can explore a wider range of possibilities uh, when you're working on a logo, for example. Uh, here's another movie that's on my People Love channel, and you might have watched this already, but it kind of deconstructs my creative process. Uh, this was inspired from all things uh, the It movie and a recent video I'd watched of Kabuki actors, and I came up with Crab Buki, a stupid slogan. My daughter Savannah calls it dad humor, and so I'm drawing it symmetrically, meaning only one half of it. 
And then I'll draw it again, but this time more precisely to figure out what shapes I need to create in Illustrator. Then I just scan it in and I use that as a roadmap to build my vector shapes precisely. Once I get base black and art, I'll print it out and I'll go back to analog, work out all my shading, all my detail, and then that'll help me build that uh, to pull the final design together. So. Um, I really think having a systematic creative process improves your proficiency and helps you actually get work done faster without compromising the quality along the way. Uh, a lot of this gets turned into merchandise like stickers. I love stickers. And I use any excuse to create whatever I want if I can turn it into a sticker. You see Bat Squatch here. Bat Squatch is on People Love Too. And Bat Squatch comes from an old uh, kind of camping a uh, horror story of sorts where Mount St. Helens, when I grew up, I grew up in Washington state and I remember uh, May 8th, 1980, Mount St. Helens blew up and me and my dad took a ladder, went up on a roof and just sat up there for an hour or so watching the eruption taking place and millions of tons of ash going up in the air. Well, years later, I'm listening to a podcast that REI used to have and it was a scary camp story talking about bat squatch. And the myth goes that when Mount St. Helens blew up, there was a Bigfoot and there was a bat in close proximity. And the explosion fused them together genetically and produced bat squatch. And I just thought it was hilarious. And we would make a almost thought of it like it's a minor league baseball team and their mascot is the bat squatch. So I made Mount St. Helens bat squatch. This is the design simplified into one color of course I use color on the uh, uh, the sticker uh, once again everything I work on starts in analog uh, my daughter will draw everything on her iPad I draw everything in analog so this was uh, by the way everything I work on is either a client project or a personal project uh, there there is no in between that's that's the dichotomy with everything I create. It's either for a client or it's either for me. And when it's for me, it can be based off of anything, a momentary inspiration. In this case, seeing the mascot for uh, Montana State University and going, really? That sucks. And deciding I'm going to do something better. They have bobcats. They could have a cool mark. And so that's where this started. And I created this. Uh, to show them so far, I haven't been able to sell it to them, but uh, if they bought this, they would make so much money off their merchandising because it's just cool. And it also, even though they have a full color, it simplifies down really well uh, in a one color format. And at some point, I'll walk through this process in a future uh, People Love movie, but it's not on my site at this point. Um, I do a lot of local branding for the local group that does the local TEDx. So here's two of their themes over the years, revolutions and vision. Savannah helped me with the vision character. Uh, so this is always a lot of fun to work on. But one year, their theme was called Fearless. And it was about just trying something you've never done before and just doing it without fear. Be fearless. Move into new areas and new ways of thinking, all that. And I decided if that's their theme, that's the way I needed to approach the branding for that year's TEDx. And I decided to limit myself. Sometimes it says the mother invention is not to have all the possibilities you normally have. And then that forces you to be uh, more unique in your thinking. So that's kind of what I did to myself. I said, I can't use a vector app or typography or fonts to create a logo type. I need to figure this out in analog. So I decided to literally paint all these letter forms using black tempera paint. And this just shows all of them went through, kind of cherry pick the ones that I thought look the best. But I didn't want this to be just kind of laid out in a way that was just, uh, it still looks like a typeface of sorts because it's so perfect. So I tried to make it imperfect and maybe a little hard to read, but really not that hard. And so this is what I did, flipped around the, the F and the E and the A and the R, but let less be the right way. And there's nobody that looks at this and doesn't read it as fearless. So uh, this was a lot of fun, but 
in the midst of doing that, I realized, God, this was a lot of fun painting those characters. I wonder if I could paint these brushes and, tur- and then uh, image trace them, turn them into vector brushes. And so I just started painting these out. And that's how I discovered my uh, vector painting style. This shows one of the first ones I did of this painted snake. And that was a lot of fun. That's why you need to experiment and try new things because you never know where it's going to lead. I didn't do this project because I thought this would come about from it. This was just a, a fringe benefit of taking risk. And that's the best thing about creativity because until you take the risk, uh, you, you're never going to discover certain things. So always take that time. If you fail, you fail. Who cares? Uh, that's part of the process. Is uh, Fear is part of the creative process. So um, I'd actually argue if you're not fearful sometimes about the creative process, you're not trying hard enough. So fear is okay. Just embrace it, go with it, see where it leads, and you never know what you're going to discover. Now, back in the day... Um, I kept being approached after um, I did a talk. I, well, I was teaching at a local college. I'd never taught illustration before. They wanted me to teach three different classes, branding, illustration, and I think one on iconography. Well, I couldn't do that full time. I could only do adjunct. So I said, how about I'll just do illustration. Recommended my friend Jeff Pollard to teach the, the logo and branding one. Uh, He designed Tiger Woods logo, NFL Hall of Fame logo, so he knows what he's doing, and he did. So they had one of the best branding people uh, in our industry, in my opinion, teaching their their logo design iconography, and then I focused on illustration. But I'd never taught in a college context before, and I went to the chair and I said, I don't know where to start. And she says, you'll do fine. I've watched you. Just uh, do what you think would work best. Well, I didn't want to admit to her, but I didn't even know what a syllabus was. So I had to get up to speed to understand what what does that even mean and what is it? Once I got that under my belt and I started teaching, I was just working one day and I go, you know what? I bet the students would like to see this process. So I started documenting everything. Eventually bought a domain, illustrationclass.com, and sharing those uh, tutorials. Now, this was all before YouTube. And so... That started getting out there and people were downloading them and liking them. And it was just images with notes um, and it would take them through a creative process. I brought those into class. The students liked it. And it eventually uh, got me invited to speak at the How Design Conference. This goes back in 2006 or 2007. I think it's 2007. And so... I did a talk on illustrative design back then. It was a lot different than this talk because uh, most of what I'm showing in this talk didn't exist at that point. And uh, that went over really, really well. And I got approached by a publisher saying, we want you to do a book on Illustrator. And I go, what do you mean? Well, like CS whatever is coming out. We want you to do a book. And I go, no, I don't want to do that. And she bugged me for a year and I kept turning it down. She goes, what would it take for you to do a book? I go, well, you have to let me write it the way I want. I don't want to write it based off of a version because that lasts one year and then it's old. Nobody needs it. I want to, I want to write one in a way that's universal, uh, that it just covers the basics, doesn't have to cover every feature but it will improve somebody's ability to build vector art. And I want it to have a video component that video comes with it. And so I wrote vector basic training. They finally relented, let me do it. The process was highly painful. Uh, I had to work with all of these editors who just didn't understand vector art or why I said this and that, and I'd have to always explain it to them. And they finally put the book out and it did really well. It's been published in seven languages now, and I believe the languages are English, German, Slovakian, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, and Russian. And uh, it's just fun when somebody comes up to me at a creative conference or at some event and says, hey, your book helped me so much. So uh, that's always the nicest compliment I can get. So if you haven't seen my Vector Basic Training book, uh, just visit my webpage, 
pplluv.com and you'll find a link for my vector basic training and you can check it out and even watch one of the videos uh, that's included with this book. Now, this is one of the best compliments I ever got from an established teacher and this was really great. And this is why I like sharing the creative process with you and everybody in between, uh, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's through a live um, uh, kind of workshop or a speaking engagement I might be doing. Uh, this is why I love helping other people do what they love to do. Now, you might not have ever seen this animation. This is my DVG lab. If you go to my LinkedIn learning courses, uh, you can find those using a special domain I have, just drawingvectorgraphics.com. It'll show you everything I've done on LinkedIn learning, my full courses. I used to do a weekly creative series for LinkedIn called DVG lab. And this was how every video would start up. Now. We had some issues that they didn't follow through with their in, and so I ended up closing this two years ago. And what I now do on People Love is how I rebranded it, and now I'm presenting the same type of content on my YouTube channel as People Love Process. This way, it's not behind a paywall. Anybody can watch it, whether you want to learn about how you can create with found textures or maybe how to create a, a sticker design. That's what you can find here. Or maybe you're creating the latest Lunar New Year, in this case of the Tiger, which was last year's theme. And we're going to be coming up with the one for this year, by the way. So make sure to uh, uh, watch the movie where I disclose what the theme is because you're going to be creating it. And then I'll review all those that submit their ideas back to me. So make sure to check that out. And of course, there's all kinds of topics categorized. Uh, whether it's branding, illustration, textures, patterns, you name it. We focus on coloring techniques, detailing techniques, and everything in between. And I appreciate you for watching it. So that's People of Process. You're obviously aware of that because you're watching this movie. Now, my teaching principle, I would say, is highly derived from Alex Hormozzi's uh, statement here. If you're not afraid of giving away your secrets, you're not giving away enough. And I totally buy into that and believe that's so true. Uh, it's not going to uh, hurt you by sharing your process with others. Uh, so take the time to, if you come up with a unique way of doing something, let other people know, help them out and help the industry as a whole get better and more proficient. Uh, this is one my, well, I'm not going to get into the whole AI argument, but this is one of the reasons why I really don't like the whole AI movement. I think it's wrong-headed in terms of creative process. Uh, you don't draw an illustrator, you build. Now, keep in mind, this was originally for um, an illustrative audience at the MFA program I teach in, and they all draw. Illustrators draw. There's just no way around it. If you don't, you're not going to be an illustrator that long. And so these were what I had to remind them because I'm a little bit of a strange creative creature in their eyes because a lot of them are either traditional illustrators or they do traditional methodology using digital tools like Painter or Procreate, etc. I'm vector base, which is kind of odd. Uh, but I do vector-based illustrations. So I had to explain to them, you don't draw an illustrator, you build. So back in 2021, right after COVID, I decided every year, every day for that entire year, I built one of these pieces of art, all using the same uh, specs, uh, square format, the same tolerances for how thick the strokes are. And the theme was all over the map. And this just shows a grid of some of my favorite ones. But I didn't, I drew these out initially with pencil, but the way I created them had nothing to do with drawing. It was all building like this.
each of the designs had a pattern made from it. Not each of them were turned into time lapse. Uh, but if you want to see more, I have a lot of other time lapse during that time period. You can watch on my YouTube channel. You'll just have to go back prior to all the content I've been posting. Uh, distinctly branded with people love. Those were just raw time-lapse videos, but they were a lot of fun. So make sure to check those out. Now, of course, I run Glitchka Studios, my own design firm uh, in the Pacific Northwest. My daughter, Savannah, very gifted uh, illustrator in her own right. And frankly, I'll just say it, I think she's a better core drawer than I am. Uh, when she was 11, uh, my parents had sent me a box that they found in their closet with all these old drawings of mine in it. And I was looking through it just cracking up because it was what I was totally into, which was uh, Star Wars at the time. And um, I was drawing aliens and warrior aliens and all that kind of stuff. And my mom would always write when the date was of whatever I drew. And I'm so glad she did because it's funny. I was looking through that, saw one I did as 11 years old. Savannah, at that same time, was 11. She brought a drawing she had done. And I said, Savannah, go get that drawing you did that you showed me the other day. And we put them side by side. And I said, OK, just look at them. Ignore what the theme is. Just look at the quality of the drawing and tell me which one's the better core drawing. Well, it was crystal clear. It was her artwork that was better in mine. And so when she was 11, I said, if you stick with this, you're going to smoke me by the time you're my age. Well, it didn't take her that long. Uh, she now smokes me. Uh, so that's why we work together because she's so proficient at drawing. When we tag team together, we can pull off some pretty cool uh, results. And even though Savannah went out on her own back in February of this year, uh, we still work on certain projects that come uh, into my shop and I'll call her up and I go, okay, Savannah, I have a project we can work on together. And I just want to walk you through some of her work. This just shows two uh, Flutter Girl illustrations she did. And she illustrated both of those uh, in Clip Studio Paint. So you can see how beautiful those work. Now, if I told her we need these in vector, she could rock it out in vector format as well because she read my book. <laughs> And whenever I would review her artwork, well, I still do this, and it's not built really that great. And I go, did you even read my book? And she just gets irritated. Uh, back before uh, Twitter became X, you had Twitterific, and they hired Savannah uh, to illustrate their brand character, Ollie, for that product. So that's her character she did there on the right. Um, of course, I use her on my own clients, such as Sinister Distilling, and I had her come up with this character, Anchor Rose, kind of a tattoo-styled character. And so we've been using this on their Anchor Rose branded um, line. This case, it's the pineapple rum. And she abuses her creative talent and makes fun of her dad by uh, telling me I have a pineapple head, which I wouldn't necessarily disagree with, but it's not very nice. You know, but it, it cracked me up. Pineapple head. OK, sure. My head's shaped like a pineapple. Uh, this is Clip Studio Paint she works in. So a niche she's found for herself is doing custom uh, VTube character illustration for different people who have their own Twitch channel. Now, these will ultimately be animated. So you'll have different arms. The eyes will blink. It might smile. And she illustrates all those components. And then an animator takes her layered file and turns them into um, something that will interact with the uh, the Twitch channel uh, host. So when he smiles or she smiles, their character, their VTube character will um, react to that. So that's kind of cool. And she shows me all these things she's working on and she's just so gifted. Uh, I just have so much fun seeing what she's working on lately or the latest sketch she's done. Now, we do a lot of brand identity, a lot of logo designs. Here shows a large gamut of different logos we've done for uh, for companies and services and food and uh, government agencies, et cetera, technology, you name it, all over the map, but a lot of animal metaphors now that I look <laughs> look at it uh, but that's that's okay because those are always the funnest ones in my opinion 
Uh, here's a project I'll just share with you quickly. Uh, this was an executive assistant company, and for whatever reason in their industry, they referred to executive assistants as, uh, ex executive assistants as um, kangaroo stars, kind of playing off the metaphor of, okay, they're going to hop to it and get things done type of thing, and they wanted a kangaroo. So this first four shown here were part of the original uh, um, kind of creative uh, presentation. Uh, the agency loved them. I loved them. And the client didn't really care for them. And she asked if she could see more uh, exploration. Okay. So we did these where I changed up the style and tried a couple different things, tried to linear line one. And the agency loved them. I loved them. And the client, well, the client didn't. Okay, well, what, what are you looking for? Because I followed the brief and I didn't see anything that falls outside the brief. And she goes, well, I'm looking for something more abstract. And I go, abstract? You mean like Picasso abstract? Is that what you mean? And she says, yeah, something like a kangaroo, but Picasso. Okay. So we did these and I was just thinking there's no way this is going to work. And I did these and Savannah helped with these as well. Um, I was just going, you know what? I kind of like these. These are kind of cool. If they go with one of these directions, they could do a whole wall in their office that turns it into an art wall. Uh, there's a lot of potential here. She looks at these and guess what? She doesn't like them either, the, the CEO of the company. But I like the colors. It reminds me of the Baja style. Can you do some explorations playing off of that style? You mean a, king, a Baja style kangaroo? Well, yeah, so we did these, and I was just going, this weird, this kind of getting kind of strange, but I liked them. I thought they were definitely that, that style that Bauhaus is known for, but uh, guess what? Yep, she didn't like these either. She eventually went back to uh, the first set of uh, directions and said, I like this one, but then she proceeded to change it to all gray and then complain about it not having enough color. And the agency at that point just said, okay, we're done. They call me up and say, Vaughn, we're, we're just going to fire this client. So go ahead and bill us for what you've done and we'll let her take whatever you created and she can do whatever she wants. And that's kind of where it ended. And the reason why I'm sharing you this with you is because you can do nothing wrong and still not make the client happy. That's just the way it goes at times. And Kangaroo Stars is one of them. I haven't even bothered to go to their website. I think they're still using a gray one. You can check it out. Uh, this was a fun one me and Savannah worked on. It was a dating service for those who like to fish and hunt. And it was called Fair Game. This is the brand mark I came up with that they went with. But there was a direction Savannah came up with when we were uh, kind of brainstorming together. And I said, I think of a Cupid. And then Savannah goes, what about a deer Cupid? And then it could be hunting like bow hunting. And she came up with this uh, a rough sketch, kind of like this character. I love this so much. I talked them into using this with the direction they picked as a secondary brand mark. Because anytime somebody uh, signs up for their service, guess what? They get a camo t-shirt and that has the primary uh, brand mark in a horizontal format on the front. And it has the secondary brand mark of the Cupid deer on the shoulder. So that was a lot of fun. Kind of a weird project, but I love how it came out. And I think the copywriting on the business cards, the ones the, the copywriters came up with are kind of hilarious. High caliber, no recoil, hook a trophy wife, ready, aim, connect, open season starts here. So uh, if you're looking for love in the great outdoors, you might want to check out fairgame.com. Um, now, our best known illustrative design of all time would have to be Dungeons and Dragons. I grew up with it. It was kind of like coming full creative circle when I worked on this. Uh, this goes back quite a few years now, but it's always fun seeing where it's been used uh, most recently. I spotted it in a little gift shop and these were these little tins with a lid that looked like the multi-sided dice. And so of course I have to get this because it has the logo we designed on it. So that was a lot of fun. And um, 
a little look at our creative process. We'll take a look at Kool-Aid. Uh, we're getting to the end here, but we worked on Kool-Aid back in 2018. We spent about a month just dialing in the gold standard for Kool-Aid Man. Uh, two weeks alone, just getting the splash and the ice cubes approved. And this is what we came up with. Then once we had them locked down, we were initially hired to do four flavor skews, turning Kool-Aid Man into an action flavor hero. And so it would start with Savannah doing a sketch of Kool-Aid Man, and in this case, a pose of him doing a cannonball. Um, I drew the background, which is going to be like a watermelon waterfall of sorts, and he's uh, doing a cannonball off the top of it. Now, on the left-hand side, I had to determine where the type was going to go, and that's why that area is kind of blank, because it'll be covered in type. Once we had this, then I would go ahead and design the final vector artwork. Now, we did four original flavor skews. Maybe it was five. It was four or five. I can't remember. I think it was five. Uh, this was one of my favorites. I just love how this one came out. You just can just see that he just jumped and he's getting ready to splash in the... Uh, the lagoon below. Here's another one that was a lot of fun, kind of uh, him swinging through a, a jungle of kiwi and strawberry flavor. So that was a lot of fun. Now we ended up doing, I believe it was five flavor skews and it went into testing, market testing, and it came back just off the charts great. And they contacted us and said, um, the testing came back really good. We want you to do everything now. And I'm like, what do you mean by everything? Well, we want you to do all of our packaging for all of our product lines for all the SKUs. And so from that point, we spent the next almost five and a half, almost six months creating all that art. I had to turn down two other really good projects that came my way and eventually lost one client because of that. Um, but Ultimately, this was all going pretty good. So the creative process would usually work like this. The creative director would say, okay, I want Cam, have him wearing sunglasses, playing with a beach ball, walking down the beach. There's fruit in the sand with snow on it. And then the, the kind of uh, Kool-Aid cooler product will be stuck behind it. And we're going, okay, well, Savannah would take this. She would do the initial sketch and she'd come up with something like that. I'd drop the Kool-Aid Coolers logo into it. We sent it off. They would come back with feedback. Okay, make sure the sky is blue. Well, yeah, I know that. Make sure the water is blue. Okay. Sand. Really? Like, yes, I know it's sand. I know it needs to be a sand color. And then add snow cap to the top of the popsicles. Okay, we can do that. So Savannah would just do a crude rudimentary uh, color sketch uh, with those corrections in it and send it back. If they approved it, then we'd move forward. I'd take this and flesh out the final vector art. I'd redraw everything uh, in terms of the fruit and, and build out all the, the product uh, illustrations in a separate file. But ultimately, when we showed them this sketch, they said, you know, we love this sketch, but use the second uh, concept color sketch you sent us that had the open tops. We really liked that. And uh, okay, we can do that. And that's where I would build the final vector art as shown here. And then it was used on the final packaging. Now, once you deliver final vector art, they'll make any changes they need on their end. And sometimes it's not exactly the way I'd handle it. Like the kite, we didn't do that. I don't really like it. I think it, it's a bit distracting. I would have handled it a little differently. They changed the name. So what it was prior was coolers, and then it changed to freeze pops, and they added all this other type. And um, I just don't like how it covers up so much of the illustration. But that's the way it goes. That's the way it works. You can't control that. And uh, it was a fun project to work on regardless. Now, certain projects Savannah doesn't like working on because she doesn't like working in these styles. Linear line, she finds it frustrating. I like it because I find it is a challenge. And so this is some of my sketches on a linear project for Canada Life, uh, Canada's largest um, insurance company. This just shows a bunch of the, the final ones. I love how this style came out. I love the golf one. I was just... So I'm still proud of that one. 
uh, just how simple it is, but you totally get what's going on. Uh, this was used on all their in-store or in, uh, in-site in signage for the insurance agencies, uh, even used on their national corporate food day packaging, which was kind of cool. And uh, here's an air project that me and Savannah worked on, uh, 1908 Candy Company, uh, a really uh, well-known old-time candy called Alexander the Grape. I remember buying it a few times growing up. And they wanted a new brand character, the original um, uh, creator of that candy line. And I said, let's give them two options. One where it's more traditional, like Alexander the Great, which is a toga and a wreath. And then we'll do one where he's more, you know, like the conqueror with a Roman helmet and a Roman short sword. And so we presented these ideas. They went with the, the short sword one on the packaging, no sword, but they animated him for um, social media promotions, which was kind of cool. So that was a lot of fun to work on that. And then the last thing I want to leave with you is three things you need to know. Now, keep in mind, I was talking to illustrators, but this these are universal principles I think can apply to you as well. And that is the first one, the biggest one, in my opinion, in the context of illustration, but also in design. Most designers don't draw. So if you develop your skills of drawing, once again, whether or not you want to become a foldable and illustrator, then you're going to be able to pull off those designs much like the Starbucks logo as opposed to the Target logo. Any creative person could do the Target logo. Not any creative person could do the Starbucks logo. So if you improve your drawing skills, you're able to do a wider range of design possibilities. That's why you want to draw. It's not about becoming an illustrator. Drawing will benefit your creative process uh, regardless. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point, creative director is just a title. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a brief from a firm and the creative director asked me to do this and that. And I'm reading it going, why? That's just, no, that's dumb. And so what I usually do is I do what they ask, but then I do what I think they really need and I push back a bit and I go, I, I really think this needs to be this way and here's why and I explain it. And many times they agree and they go, oh, we like what you did there. Yeah, let's definitely do that. Other times they might stick to their guns and say, no, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, one of the most recent examples of that is it was for a brand doing energy drinks and uh, they wanted a moose. For a really thin can, I go, you do realize moose, a moose is like, if you had to simplify it into a geometric shape, what shape would you think? Well, a rectangle that's horizontal because of the rack that's on a moose. And they don't strike me as, as animals with a lot of energy. Just think of Bullwinkle. I think of Goofy more than I think of energy uh, with the moose, but okay, we'll do a moose. I go, you sure you wouldn't want to do a bear? Bear would be kind of cool growling and the, the shape would fit better on that can format on the label. And they go, no, nope, these are our, le <laughs> our legally approved animals. And I go, oh, okay. It's that's where it's at at this point. Okay, fine. So we did it. Uh, you just have to go with the flow, but don't be afraid. My whole point is don't be afraid uh, or be intimidated for that matter, just because somebody has a has a title. Uh, that's all it is. It's a title. If you think something's going to be stronger a certain way, then by all means, share it or better yet, show them, show them what they asked for, but then also show them, but I think it would look better if we handle it this way. They're going to appreciate that because they know you have your best interest in mind for their project. So that's the best way to build uh, relationships with those people who can hire you, in my opinion. Uh, the next one, you get the work you show. Um, I was at an illustration conference back in 2003. I just started my studio a year earlier than that. Uh, met a, met a, a friend of mine who is rep by the same agency I used to use out of Canada. His name's Paul Howalt. And he said, hey, Vaughn, you need to go to the illustration conference. I'm going to be there. Then we can hang out. And um, I did, and when I was there, I went to a session and I sat down next to a really well-known illustrator I knew of. Uh, I'd never met him in person. Well, I take that back. I had met him in person one other previous time. 
Um, uh, Craig Frazier, based out of San Francisco, a brilliant uh, designer and an illustrator. And at the time, he wrote a book, a volume of all of his illustration. And I sat down next to him. He had his book with him. And I said, hey, can I look through your book? And he said, sure. And he hands me his book. And I'm looking through it. And I'm going, whoa, Craig, when would you do that? Oh, I just did that for fun. I go, oh, okay. And then I get to something else. I go, I've never seen this. Who would you do that for? And he goes, no, I just did that. That's just an idea I came up with. Well, after about the third time of doing that, and the next time I asked him, who is this for? He just looked at me and he says, Vaughn, you get the work you show. And that's always stuck with me ever since then. It's been 20 years since he said that to me. And it's the one principle on promotion that's proven to be absolutely true. If you don't like doing certain types of work, guess what work you don't want to show within your portfolio? That kind of work. If you want to get more work, uh, let's say doing illustrative logos, then guess what? Show it. But don't wait for somebody to hire you because that might not never happen. Uh, just do it. Just pick a client, such as what I mentioned about Armorall. That'd be a great idea for me uh, to rebrand it as if I was hired to do it and show the world what I can do because you never know where it's going to go. And that's how you need to uh, think in the marketplace for today. You need to show people what you can do so that they can see what you can do. And if you do that enough, they'll realize you can do it and they'll hire you to do it for their uh, benefit. So a uh, great principle and it's proven to be so true. So what type of project do you think your work would be ideal for? That's what you need to be able to answer. And if you don't have a clear picture in your head to answer this, guess what? This is where you want to start. This is what you want to figure out. What do you love to do? What would you love to be hired to do? How would you love to see your work be used? And if you can answer that, then you're going to demystify how to promote yourself, how to promote yourself, that is. So um, that's my uh, what I want to leave with you. Uh, thank you for watching this. And I want to share, because every time I'm invited uh, whenever I travel to speak or do a live workshop, I always share the various ways the audience can connect with me. So feel free to connect with me using whatever social platform you prefer. I'm also on Blue Sky, Threads, and Mastodon as well. A big thank you to everyone who watches my content on this channel. Your likes, shares, subscriptions, and memberships all help me grow it. I really do appreciate it because it helps me to continue producing original creative projects I can share with you. Until next time, thank you for watching People of Process. And as always, I hope this content helps you to improve your own creative process.